Let's continue with our update category request and add validation handling to XHR requests. The first thing that we need to do is that we actually need to add the logic to update the category name because right now when that button is clicked, it doesn't really update the category, right? We're just responding with status OK. We actually don't really need to respond with any data. So we're going to get rid of this and let's simply return response object. Now in here, we can call some sort of update method on the category service to actually update the category entity. So we can do something like this category service update past the category entity and the name that we want to update. Now, if we had more than one field, more than the name field for the category uh, entity, then we would maybe pass a DTO object here or an array. But since we're only storing the name for the categories, it's okay to pass the name as a string directly into the update method. So let's create this update method now. The name will be string and this method will be similar to our create method because we essentially just need to set the name to the new name that we get as an argument. So we can basically take this, copy it and paste it in here and we'll get rid of this. And that's pretty much it. Now, as you can see, this is the same as these three lines in here, right? These two lines and this line. We can actually uh, remove these three lines from here and simply call the update method within here because we already have the category entity and we can pass the name like this and we're setting the user right here and then the rest the update will handle. Now the update doesn't return anything, it's void. So we could do the update this way and simply return category here this way, or we could make the update actually return the category entity. It's up to you which way you want to do it. But since the create returns category entity, I'm gonna follow the same uh, logic and we'll return the category entity from the update method as well. Now let's go back to the controller and I think we should also add the validation for the ID argument in here because it may not always be a valid integer. It can be a text and I don't want to execute unnecessary queries if that's the case because we're executing a query here by finding a category by the ID and if this is invalid ID and we cast it to integer, this becomes zero and we're basically executing an unnecessary query. So why don't we handle that validation within our update category request validator class. So let's duplicate this and we'll change this to integer and this will be ID. We can also make the ID be required. So we'll turn this into an array and add ID right here. All right. So now that we've set the validation on the controller side, let's figure out how we can send the proper JSON when validation exception occurs. Because right now, as you saw in the last lesson, it does the redirect, right? But it doesn't actually redirect the user, but we have that handling in our uh, validation exception middleware. We are trying to redirect the user to the refer with the status of 302. And we should not do any of this if the validation error occurs on an XHR request. So what we need to do here is that we need to check if the request is an XHR request. And if it is, then we need to prepare a proper JSON response with validation errors and the proper status code. Otherwise, we can do whatever we're doing here if it's not an XHR request. Now, I mentioned XHR. So what is XHR? XHR stands for XML HTTP request, which simply put allows you to make requests to the server without the need of page refresh. Ajax is basically an abstraction of XHR, so to speak. Now, some frameworks or libraries that provide Ajax call abstractions automatically add something called X requested with header, and it comes with the value of XML HTTP request, which then can be used to check on the backend if the request is XHR or not. Libraries like jQuery, Axios, and so on do that automatically, but Fetch API, however, does not set that by default. So we have to pass that header in ourselves. So let's open the categories.js file here and add the header within uh, right here, wherever we're passing the headers. So let's add a comma here and the header that uh, I mentioned is X requested with and the value should be XML HTTP request. 
Now we will have to repeat this everywhere wherever we use the fetch API. So I think it's time that we abstract this fetch API call a little bit so that we don't have to set the headers every time manually. So I'm going to do that off the recording and basically create a simple abstraction of this fetch request. So as you can see, our categories.js now looks much cleaner. We no longer have the fetch API calls directly. We have this post function call and the get function call. And then we're no longer specifying the headers here or stringifying anything or uh, parsing the response to JSON. All that has been abstracted away into this ajax.js. And we are then exporting the get and post uh, functions that we're calling in here and i'm going to go over the ajax file in just a minute before that as you can see the get method basically accepts the url and it also accepts the data as the second argument but in this case we don't have any data and then we are simply opening the edit category model now in the case where we're saving the category we are making a post request to this endpoint and we're passing in the data object which simply contains name in this case and then we are logging the response. Now if we open the ajax.js file we see that we have this ajax function as well as the get and post functions and we have this get csr fields function extracted in here and then we are exporting ajax get and post. Now get and post functions simply call the ajax function and they pass the get and post as the argument so it's pretty much just a syntactic sugar. Now the ajax function accepts the url the method and the data then we're forcing the method to be lowercase and we're building the options that we're passing to the fetch api now we're setting the default headers here the method and we're also checking if the method of the request is one of the csrf methods which is post put delete and patch and if it is then we're uh, stringifying the data object and we're also adding the csrf fields which we get from this get csrf fields function call now if the method of the request is get then we don't need to add the body to the options instead we need to add the query parameters and we do that by using the url search params where we pass the data object and we simply append it to the url and finally we call the fetch function pass the url the options and then we uh, parse the response to json by default and return the promise so basically it's very simple abstraction that way we don't have to do all of this manually every time we need to make a fetch request instead now we can either call the ajax and pass the method that we need or we can use get and post all right, so I think now we're ready to implement the backend check for the XHR request because now we have abstracted everything the way we wanted and we're also passing this important header that we can use to check if the request is an XHR. So let's go back to the validation exception middleware and we have this request service uh, class here where we get the refer from. Why don't we create another method here to check if the request is XHR or not? So why don't we do something like if this request service is XHR and pass the request, then let's return a JSON response. Now we already have the response formatter service that we can inject in the constructor. So we can do something like return this response formatter as JSON and simply do response. And as the second argument, we'll pass the JSON data. Now I also want to set the status code of the response. Now Laravel uses 422 for validation errors. So I think we can use the same status code in this case as well. So we can do with status 422. Now let's inject the response formatter in the constructor here. So we'll do private read only response formatter and this looks good and if the request is not xhr then we're simply going to do what we were doing before where we get the refer the old data from the request we're flashing the sessions and then redirecting the user to the refer url with the status of 302. now let's create this is xhr method on the request service this will return boolean and this is a very simple method to implement because we already know which header we're passing and which header we need to check to see if it's an XHR request or not. So we can do return request get header line and the header line is X requested with and this has to equal to this value XML HTTP 
request. So let's paste that in and that's it. Now, if you remember, we also added a to do item in one of the previous lessons to check for XHR requests within the start sessions middleware. So if we open the start sessions middleware, we have this to do right here. We're putting the previous URL in the session here if the request method is get. Now the problem is that if the request method is get for the XHR requests, it will also put the request URL in the, as the previous URL in the session. And we don't want to do that. So basically we want to make sure that we only put the previous URL in the session if the request method is get and it's not an XHR request. Now, because we already have the isXHR uh, method on the request service class, we can use that to check in here. So we can do something like request get method equals get and the request is not XHR and we'll add the negation here. Now let's inject the request service in the constructor here. So we'll do private read only request service. Let's format the code. And I have a typo here. This should be request with an E. So let's paste that in. And we also need to pass the request here. And I think we're good to go to test this out. Let's remove this to do item from here because we no longer need that. Let's open the browser, refresh the page. Let's open the dev tools here. Let's click edit on the category three. The get request is made and is successful. It contains the proper response. It contains the proper headers. We're passing the X requested with header, which is set to XML HTTP request. So everything seems to be working correctly with our Ajax refactor. Now let's click save on this and we're getting 422 status code, which is a validation error. Now we are passing the name of the category. So why are we getting 422? Let's inspect to see what the response is. Now we see that response contains the validation errors and the validation error states that ID is required and ID must be an integer. That's the new rules that we added and we're not passing the ID as part of the payload. We're passing the CSRF name, value and name, but not the ID. The ID is part of the URL. There is actually an easy fix for that. If we go back to the categories controller, we just simply need to append the arguments that are being passed to the URL. So we basically just need to merge the two arrays, the get parsed body and the arguments array. So we're going to use the plus operator, but we'll do arguments plus the parsed body. Now we can also adjust this because we no longer need to access the ID on the args, but instead it will be contained within the data that is returned from the validation validate method. So let's do that. And now if we click on save, we no longer get the validation errors. Now it returns 200. Now if I save an empty category, then again, we're getting 422 with the validation error that name is required. One thing to note here before uh, we end the lesson is that we can actually do the validation on the route arguments within the routes file, within the route definition. We don't actually need to add the validation to the validator class for the ID argument. I just wanted to show you an example of how you could do that if you wanted to add some custom validation to your arguments. But if it's just a simple integer validation for the ID argument, that can be done via regular expression matching within the route definition. So if we open the web routes file here, wherever we are defining the ID placeholder, we can actually add a colon here and put a regular expression. So we can say that this needs to be an integer zero through nine. Now, if the post request is made on this URL where the ID passed to the URL is not an integer, it's simply not going to invoke this route. And we can do the same thing for the other uh, routes where the ID is required. So we can do the same thing in here as well. Now to show you this in action, uh, let's go back to the browser and let's visit categories slash three. And this returns JSON for the category three because it's a get request. We're hitting this route right here. But if I pass a string now instead of an integer, we see that we get 404. Now without this validation in here, if I remove this and refresh the page, we see that we are still getting 404, but this is a different kind of 404. If we go back to the code and open the controller where we have this get route, 
we are hitting this section right here. We are simply generating a response with a 404 if the category is not found, but we're still executing this query. If I add a var dump here, one, and refresh the page, we see that that gets hit, which means that the route is being executed. But if we add that validation back and refresh the page, we see that the route is no longer invoked. So just something to think about. It is up to you how you want to handle the route parameter validation. You can do it through the uh, routes within here, or you can do it through the validation the way we did it within here. You can do both. It is really up to you. But if you only have just a simple validation of IDs like this, you could do that within the routes. But if you have anything more complicated than that, then you can do it within the validator the way I just did it in here. All right, so now all is left to actually parse this on the front end and display the errors to the user the way we want. We can display them either using some pop-up alert or use the bootstrap alerts and find the field by the name and find the related div and make it visible and so on. Basically, there are multiple ways that we can do that. I'm going to show that to you in the next video. So thank you so much for watching. Smash the like button if you like my videos and subscribe to the channel to make sure that you don't miss any of the new videos. Thanks again and I'll see you in the next one.